What if I told you you could get faster and fitter by doing more of this and less of this? Sound good? Well, in this video, I'm gonna explain why sleep is important, how it impacts your fitness and athletic performance, and also techniques and hacks that you can use to maximize it. Before we crack on though, let's have a poll. I want to know, do you pay more attention to your sleep quality when you're training hard? If you click on the link, it'll take you to the poll. You can vote yes or no. Most athletes understand that if you want to get fitter and stronger, you've got to train. But that's only half of it. If you want to reap the rewards and benefits of that training, your body needs to be given adequate time to rebuild and recover. And above and beyond, the most powerful recovery tool out there is sleep. Okay, so Roger Federer isn't a cyclist, but he has attributed his very long, successful and consistent career at the top of his sport down to getting 12 hours of sleep a night, which is a huge amount. And the importance of sleep isn't lost on top cyclists either. For example, Team Sky, or Team Ineos as they're known now, actually have individual mattresses that they take to races for their riders to sleep on, such as the importance they place on it. And they also went a step further and got Chris Froome, his own personal luxury motorhome, to sleep in, or until the, the UCI banned it. Typical. But what does sleep actually do? Well, let's look into the science of it. Now, sleep is a lot more complicated than most people would give it credit for. Scientists have spent years and years researching it, and we still don't fully understand everything about it. But what we do know is that sleep is in four different phases, and these four phases repeat throughout the night in sleep cycles. And typically, you have four to five sleep cycles in a given night's sleep. Phase one is kind of like the dozing off phase. You typically spend one to five minutes doing this, and if you get disturbed in the night, you can reach this sort of dozing off, very light phase again. And then the next phase, phase two, is light sleep. And this is the dominant phase of sleep. People tend to spend roughly half of their total sleep time in light sleep. During this phase, your temperature, your body temperature lowers slightly, your heart rate lowers, and your brain activity changes. And the first cycle of light sleep is usually 15 to 25 minutes long in most adults. Phase three is REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, and it's where the band takes its name. During this phase, the brain is restored, and the ideas and thoughts and skills that were acquired by your brain during the day are cemented as memories. Phase four, the final phase, is deep sleep, also known as slow wave sleep. And from the perspective of athletic performance, this is probably the most important and critical phase. Now, during this phase, the brain produces a pattern of waves, which are quite characteristic and known as delta waves. And it's from this that it gets its name, slow wave sleep. It's during this phase that the body produces 95% of its growth hormones, including human growth hormone, which is absolutely critical for rebuilding and repairing your body so that it can get fitter and stronger. And slow wave sleep helps with other body processes too, and is likely to boost your immune system. Slow wave sleep cycles typically last around 20 to 40 minutes, but the amount of human growth hormone that your body produces decreases with age, meaning that the quality of the sleep that you get becomes more and more important. Oh, morning. Well, now that you understand the different cycles of sleep and the different phases, you can perhaps appreciate why not all sleep is equal. It really is a case of the quality is key. And if you're interested in the quality of your sleep, how good a sleeper you are, then it's something you can actually measure using what wearable sleep tracking devices. For example, I use a Whoop, but there are other ones out there. 
The WHOOP measures your heart rate and the gaps between your heartbeats. This data is processed with clever algorithms to track your sleep cycles, work out your heart rate variability and recovery. And in addition, you can customise a daily questionnaire to track other lifestyle factors to see how they affect your sleep over time, such as, did you travel on a plane? Did you drink alcohol or take any medication? Did you eat a vegan diet? And much more. The app is able to collate this data, present it to you and suggest which behaviours are beneficial and detrimental to your sleep. And as a nerdy scientist, I absolutely love this stuff. But I'm not alone. Tade Pogacar wears one too. And to find out more about how much sleep athletes get and how much they, well, how good quality that sleep is and also how this impacts the fitness of athletes, I'm going to speak to Kristen Holmes, who's the Vice President of Performance Optimization at WHOOP, because they've gathered a really useful and insightful amount of data on this subject. Kristen, thanks. Hi, for- good to see you, Oliver. Yeah, thanks for coming on the call. Um, my first question, right, how much sleep do, do athletes tend to, tend to get? You know, spending eight hours in bed in, is, that's kind of the, the recommendation, right? But by the National Sleep Foundation, but how much time we need to spend in bed is going to vary for everyone, right? If I can spend seven hours and 42 minutes in bed and, um, you know, only spend 30 minutes of that time awake and then spend almost 50% of that total time in deeper stages of sleep, I'm winning, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a really good spot. Um, but a lot, a lot, oftentimes because people are really poor sleepers because they haven't managed their day appropriately, or, you know, they're kind of inconsistent with their sleep wake time, or they don't have a cold, dark, quiet room, you know, hygiene is really important, right? They might actually have to spend more time in bed in order to get that quality sleep. I mean, there's a lot of people, they lead very busy lives. They've got maybe yeah. children or whatever, yeah. and they struggle to maybe have 10 hours available for sleeping time. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying there's really interesting. You're saying if you have the good good habits, yeah, maximize the window of sleep you have and make that yeah. more more quality sleep. And and how can you tell if you're uh, if you're getting enough sleep? Yeah. So if you take caffeine out of the mix, um, you shouldn't feel sleepy during the day. Adults should not feel sleepy during the day, unless you're doing huge training. So if we've got, you know folks who are training for a massive event or are in a preseason or in a functional overreaching stage where they're really um, putting on tons of volume and intensity, they might feel sleepy and need a nap. And and naps are amazing recovery amplifiers, right? If if you are training super hard, like you're doing double sessions, for example, morning and afternoon workout, or you're a triathlete, naps can be incredibly powerful, but the normal adult um, should not feel sleepy during the day. So that's the like quickest, dirtiest way to understand if you're in fact, you're getting sufficient amount of sleep, um, you know, during your nocturnal kind of, uh, you know, nighttime sleep. But how does sleep affect athletic performance? Well, there have been several studies, in particular, several studies looking at cycling performance, one of which is a study from Deakin University, which took competitive endurance cyclists and then looked at how their time trial performance was affected with respect to sleep. So first, they gave them their standard night sleep, which was around six and a half to seven hours. It then added 30% extra sleep onto that, which brought them up to around eight and a half hours on average, and then looked at their performance with restricted sleep at less than five hours a night, which was 30% less than what they got on average. The test involved a blind time trial effort with a fixed amount of work to do and lasting around an hour. Now the crazy thing from the results is that after just two nights of sleep restriction, the riders completed the time trial in an average of 60.4 minutes versus 58.8 minutes with their normal sleep. So that's a significant amount of difference and a 3% decline in performance. But on the other hand, when they got extra sleep, you can see, well, with three nights extra sleep, they finished their time trial at nearly two minutes faster than they had before. A 3% improvement there in performance, swinging the other way. 
The perceived level of exertion remained the same. The time trial felt just as hard, the riders just went quicker. But with extra sleep, they were also recorded as being in a better mood, having quicker reaction times and a longer attention span. And when you consider that all three of the Grand Tours this year were won by a margin of less than two minutes, it really does make you think. And I guess the take home message is that if you've got a big cycle event where you wanna do as well as you can, then if you can get up to 90 minutes extra sleep the three nights before it, well, it's not gonna do you any harm at all. I was intrigued to find out more about how nutrition can influence your sleep. So I arranged a call with Dr. Stacey Sims, who's an exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist. She's also co-founder of a company called ERW with the chef, Hannah Grant, who you may remember from previous GCN videos. Now, one of the goals of ERW, which stands for Eat, Race, Win, is to help top athletes with their hydration so that they can sleep and recover better. I mean, you've heard things like don't have alcohol, don't have caffeine, all these things around like it's going to interfere with your sleep. But what it comes down to is if you have a lot in your stomach or your digestive system within two hours of going to bed, you're not going to get into a deep reparative sleep, which is what we want. Because ultimately, when you have a lot of food close before bed, then we have more of what we call a sympathetic drive to really keep your body working to digest the food. So all of the um, aspect of the rest and digest as uh, order of, of sleep goes to digest the food. So instead of being able to get into that slow wave sleep and the REM sleep, your body just can't do it. It doesn't have enough of the signaling to get into that, that reparative sleep because it's trying to digest the food. So regardless of all the wives' tales that you've heard or people telling you to eat this and not that, it really comes down to the timing before bed is really important. And then when we think about during the day, what can you do to improve your energy levels and then to get into a really good sleep pattern? You want to think about eat, eating watery fruits and veggies because that really helps with your gut microbiome, which again feeds forward into metabolic considerations for sleep and getting into good sleep, staying hydrated so that your body works well, um, going easy on the booze, of course. And caffeine is a funny one because some people are really receptive to caffeine and get overstimulated with one shot of espresso. And other people have a genetic predisposition to being a really fast metabolizer. So they'll have a shot of espresso before bed and it doesn't interfere. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's just thinking about backing up your calories earlier in the day so that you're not eating right before bed, including that snack that so many athletes try to get in as a casein or a protein drink before bed, yeah. that can even interrupt sleep. And when you're uh, thinking about it from an athletic standpoint, you need that good sleep for reparation. Yeah, that's really interesting because that is something that a lot of athletes have told. It's probably advice that we've even put out on GCN that is this thing about, yes, have you your casein protein in whatever form it is before bed and that's a that's like a key thing so you're saying that that's that's not that's not actually a, a good idea for sleep quality. no unless it's just casein and water but most people won't do casein and water they mix it with something else and when you start mixing things with the casein it creates uh you know food that needs to be digested quickly and then that's what pulls away from the parasympathetic aspect of getting to sleep if it's casein in water, it's not such a big difference because casein is so slow to digest, it doesn't pull a lot. And is there a rough, a rough sort of rule of thumb that, that people can take away in terms of the, the time window, the gap you would give before going to bed, before eating uh, uh, something? Yeah, we say give yourself two hours before you go to bed and that's the last time you have something. So if you're planning it well, you can still get that you know last dose of protein in before you go to bed, but just make sure that it's not right before bed, that's extended that two hours before bed. How can you get the most out of your sleep? Well, in no particular order, here are our quick fire top tips. The darker your room, the better you will sleep. Light influences your brain, so the darker you can make your room, the more time you will get in the restorative stages of sleep. 
Temperature. Set your room temperature at or around 20 degrees Celsius. You'll fall asleep quicker when your bedroom is slightly cool. Also, use your bed for sleep. Avoid doing work or watching TV in bed. The more you can train your body to associate your bed with sleep, the more adept you will be at falling asleep in that space. And in addition to this, screens are stimulating and keep you awake. Avoid using your phone or computer in bed because screen time makes it more difficult to fall asleep. So yes, if you're watching this video in bed, that's not good. We'd also recommend setting a caffeine cutoff. For greater sleep efficiency, consciously refrain from caffeine consumption at least four hours before bed. And be wary of alcohol too. Just like caffeine, alcohol can impact the body hours after you've consumed it. Ideally, you could booze at lunchtime. Alcohol is a sedative, but it does decrease the quality of your sleep and impairs recovery. Sleep consistency is important too. Studies have shown the quality of your sleep can increase if you fall asleep and wake at a similar time every day. And finally, you can use wearable tech. I've been using a Whoop for the last couple of years and it's really helped me track my sleep and find out what affects it and how I can then learn to improve it and get into good habits. I find that a sleep tracker like this makes you more accountable for your sleep. So there you have it. You can sleep yourself faster. I hope you found this video useful and informative. And let us know in the comments section down below what your tips and tricks are for getting a good night's sleep. And let us know any videos you'd like to see in the future around this topic. But in the meantime, I uh, wish you all a very good night's sleep and I'm gonna practice what I preach and, uh, well, try and get a bit, try and get a bit faster. Night.